Um, welcome to the Center for Independent Studies. My name is Oliver Habich. I'm a research fellow here at the Center. My great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event, which is all about population growth. And it's also an event in our Meet the Researchers uh, series of events. You know, once a month we would like to show you what we are up to and uh, what projects uh, are currently going on at the CIS. And one of them, of course, a big um, research area is um, population growth. My colleague uh, Stephen Kirchner is just preparing a paper in this series on the economic effects of population growth. And usually when economists talk about population growth, they pretend almost as if it di didn't really matter. Because as we all know, there are small countries that are rich and there are small countries that are poor and there are big countries that are rich and there are big countries that are poor. And therefore, some economists conclude it doesn't really matter whether you're big or small because you can be rich or poor either way. But here comes Stephen and argues that actually perhaps we should think again because population size may after all matter and a bigger population may have some advantages that a smaller population simply can't achieve. And Stephen is going to tell us a bit about it in this talk tonight. Stephen, of course, is a research fellow here at the center, but he's also a senior lecturer at UTS here in Sydney. And before that, he had quite a varied career. He worked as an economist for Action Economics he was a director with Standard & Poor's, working both in Australia and in Singapore. And he also advised a number of um, um, parliamentarians, both in the um, House of Representatives and the Senate. But uh, tonight, he is all with us. He's a research fellow, as I said, in the economics program at the Center for Independent Studies. And it's my great pleasure to welcome him now to tell us about um, population growth and why it matters to the economy. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Oliver. So what I'll do firstly is to deal with an important assumption and uh, a potential objection and, and get that out of the way first. So tonight when I talk about living standards, I'm going to assume that living standards are reasonably well proxied by real GDP per capita. And we know that GDP is a very imperfect measure of well-being. But for our purposes, all that really matters is that GDP per capita is positively correlated with a lot of things that we uh, associate with well-being. So most obviously consumption, uh, but it also correlates positively with a lot of outcomes in relation to health, uh, education, environmental quality, and so on. Uh, and so uh, to the extent that people, anyone in this room, uh, lies awake at night worrying about global warming, then I would argue that climate change, uh, adaptation, and emissions abatement are easier to do if you're rich than if you're poor. Okay, so the three perspectives I'm going to look at tonight I've called hands, mouths, and minds. So the first of these is the approach that probably most economists would take to uh, population growth and its relationship with economic growth. And this is basically uh, an outcome of the uh, various models that economists use for economic growth. And generally speaking, this perspective argues that population growth, at least in the long run, is neutral for living standards. The Mao's perspective is basically Malthusianism, and uh, this argues that population growth reduces living standards. And the Mind's perspective is one that's uh, most commonly associated with Julian Simon, although it's also an implication of some of the newer models of economic growth. And this perspective argues that population growth actually raises living standards. And I'm going to argue in favour of this perspective, and I'm also going to claim this perspective for classical liberalism, because although you don't have to be a classical liberal to embrace this perspective, uh, it probably helps. Okay, so starting off with the hands perspective, uh, Economists, when they look at the population, typically they're only interested in a subset of the population, and that's the working age population. And they're probably actually only interested in a subset of the working age population, and that's the people who are actively engaged in the workforce. And what they pull out of the labour market data is basically hours worked. And hours worked is basically the <coughs> contribution that people make to economic growth. So in this perspective, labor is just an input into the production process. And the output you get from additional labor inputs basically depends on how you write down your growth model. But the assumptions that economists typically make uh, 
uh, about things like the returns to scale typically give you the result that uh, population growth at best makes a positive contribution to growth in the short run, uh, but no long run contribution. So you get temporary effects, but not permanent effects. Uh, so if you look at economic growth and sort of decompose it into its drivers, we typically find that labor's not that important. Uh, the main drivers of economic growth are capital accumulation, so physical and human capital, uh, and technology broadly defined, and I'd include institutions uh, in technology. Uh, so it's capital and technology that's the sort of heavy lifter in terms of raising living standards. And there's no real connection in these models between labor or population on the one hand and capital accumulation and technology on the other. They're quite independent of one another. And so where does technical change come from? Well, these models basically assume it's exogenous. So innovation and technology basically falls from the sky. You don't really have anything to say about where it comes from. And so most economists would treat population as basically a predetermined constant, which is to say they're not very interested in demography, typically speaking. Okay, so economists do recognize that there are gains from population growth associated with the division of labor, uh, increased specialization, and economies of scale. But you're trading off these gains against a loss, and the loss comes from diminishing returns to additional labor, and the fact that as you add more labor, you're diluting your capital stock. Uh, and so in the long run, typically the loss dominates. So again, you get no long run effect from population growth on economic growth. And this assumption of diminishing returns is really a legacy in classical economic thought from Malthusianism. And I'll talk a bit more about that uh, as we go along. So I'm gonna give you three examples of the hands perspective in action. And these three examples are designed to show you that most economists cannot argue uh, persuasively in favor of population growth or immigration. So the first example comes from Peter MacDonald. Uh, Peter MacDonald is a demographer rather than an economist. And so he put out a paper with a co-author which basically puts the Treasury's intergenerational report assumptions uh, through the Productivity Commission's uh, demographic model, which is called MODEM. And when he does this, he finds that immigration raises real GDP per capita. But the mechanism by which it does this is firstly to slow population aging. And when you slow population aging, what you get is an increase in hours worked. So again, it's the hours worked that is assumed to be the contribution that population makes to economic growth. And although this is, de is a demographic model, most economic models would basically give you the same result. So I think this is a reductionist and not to say trivial approach to looking at the effects of population on economic growth. And what you find is that when you push on economists uh, who are trying to argue in favor of population growth and immigration, uh, that they typically start to fall back on non-economic arguments. And so there's a quote here from Peter MacDonald who does, does just that. So he says, the size of an economy is not a measure of economic well-being or well-being, uh, but it does influence the international forums to which the country is invited. Now, maybe if you're Kevin Rudd, you care about what international forums you, we get invited to, but if you're a normal person, this is probably not going to be very <laughs> persuasive. Okay, the next example that I'm gonna give comes from uh, the late David Pope. Uh, David was a very prominent uh, Australian economic historian. Uh, he was probably the preeminent authority on the role of population in Australia's economic history. And what David Pope argues is that through much of Australia's history, immigration has lowered our living standards. Now, why does he argue this? He argues this because the rate of immigration has exceeded the rate of capital formation and therefore diluted the capital stock. And the standard growth models tell you that if you dilute your capital stock, then real GDP per capita is going to decline. Um, but this conclusion is based entirely on his assumption that the neoclassical growth model is the correct model. Uh, I mean, he, although he's got some data to support the idea that 
there's um, dilution of capital by labour, the implication for growth is purely an assumption. So David concluded that historically Australia had traded off uh, higher living standards against the populate or perish imperative. So basically he's saying we sacrificed our living standards in order to uh, populate the country. Um, and I think this is a very implausible conclusion and it really rests on a very flimsy assumption. Um, but, but David is kind of the, the authority in terms of the contribution that uh, population growth has made to Australia's economic history. The third perspective I'm going to give comes from, or uh, well the third example I'm going to give comes from Max Corden. This is his 40 million Aussies speech. Uh, this was his Richard Snape Memorial Lecture. Uh, Max is in favour of population growth and immigration and in his speech he basically runs through the various arguments and he concludes that there are two arguments in favour of a greater uh, population. One is the populate or perish argument and the other is the economies of scale argument. And as Max would be the first to concede, the, uh, the economies of scale argument is not very uh, persuasive for a small open economy like Australia because we can basically import economies of scale through trade. So what's he left with? He's left with populate or perish. Um, so again, he's kind of falling back on a non-economic, almost mercantilist argument uh, for a larger population. So looking at these three examples, you can see that most economists are really incapable of defending uh, population growth and immigration. And the reason they're incapable of defending it is that population growth and immigration really just doesn't do very much in the standard models. Okay, so the next perspective I'm going to look at is the Mouths perspective. This is Malthusianism. I think most of you would be familiar with the basic Malthusian idea. This is the notion that as income increases, population increases in line with income. So real GDP per capita basically stagnates and you get the Malthusian trap. And we tend to be very dismissive of Malthus uh, these days, but the fact is that uh, what Malthus had to say was empirically true for most of human history. And it was basically empirically true up to the point that Malthus uh, wrote his, uh, his essay. Uh, so part of the problem with Malthus is uh, the assumptions he makes, uh, one of which is that the uh, passion between the sexes will remain nearly in its present state. So what Malthus failed to anticipate was the extent to which technology would allow us to turn uh, passion between the sexes into recreation rather than procreation. So we tend to give Malthus a bad rap, but if you look at the later Malthus, because his work went through several iterations, if you look at the Malthus of, say, 1820, in his work he explicitly states that uh, economic and political liberty can lead to what he calls uh, prudential habits among the lower classes. And these pretent prudential habits get you out of the Malthusian trap. So he explicitly allows for the possibility that uh, economic and political liberalism will get you out of this situation. It wasn't his core <coughs> sort of expectation, uh, but he did allow for the possibility. So he thought the Malthusian trap was more likely un under despotism rather than liberalism. Uh, so we're much too tough on Malthus. Malthus is actually a liberal. Okay, so the, uh, we get a Malthusian legacy in classical economics, which is to say that uh, Ricardo and Mill took the insights of Malthus and basically turned it into the idea of diminishing returns. And that assumption is still embedded in a lot of growth models. Uh, so we're still stuck with this legacy of Malthus in classical economics. We also find the Malthusian legacy in Keynesian economics because Keynes is an enthusiastic Malthusian uh, and as a result also an enthusiastic eugenicist. And uh, Keynes faces a dilemma, however, because if you start implementing sort of eugenicist type policies, then he faces the problem of, well, where's the demand going to come from? And so in the late 1930s, Keynes gives a speech to the Eugenics Society uh, where he says that 
when Malthusian devil population is chained up, Malthusian devil unemployment is liable to break loose. And this is one of the many contradictions and tensions within uh, Keynes's thought, and it's one that he never satisfactorily uh, resolved. Um, but where we tend to see this Keynesian legacy today is in the tendency to view population growth as basically uh, in terms of demand rather than supply. And this is how business groups and the housing industry tend to argue in favour of population growth. They like population growth and immigration because this leads to more demand, and if you're a business person or in the housing industry, um, this looks like a good idea. Um, so to give an example of this in action, a uh, housing industry group recently put out a report that was arguing in favour of population growth and immigration for Australia, um, but in that report basically what they were trying to do was to argue that if we didn't have strong population growth, um, house prices will f would fall. And so they're basically trying to scare people into uh, supporting uh, higher population growth and immigration. And of course, if you don't already own housing, <coughs> this is probably not going to be a very persuasive argument. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, Mouths perspective. Uh, the Minds perspective is one that we frequently associate with the late Julian Simon, although Julian Simon in many ways was just <laughs> building on work that was done by people like Simon Kuznets, who was an economist, uh, Esther Bosserup, uh, Harold Barnett, and Chandler Morse. And all of these people were very interested in the relationship between population, uh, resources, and economic growth. But the mind perspe mind's perspective also comes out of the uh, recent developments in the theory of economic growth, uh, particularly what's called new or endogenous growth theory and this is most closely associated with the work of Paul Roma. And what Paul Roma does is establish a direct and positive relationship between population growth and technical change. And in the long run, it's technical change or technological improvement that drives the increase in living standards. Uh, and so what new growth theory does is that it introduces the idea of increasing returns to scale and so we're finally, uh, growth theory is finally liberated from the legacy of Malthus. So Roma hasn't really spent a lot of time uh, ex uh, sort of expounding on yeah. the nature of this relationship because he's kind of interested in other things, but people like Julian Simon have built on his work and uh, sort of teased out the implications. So this is the best statement of the mind's perspective, and this is basically where the title of my talk tonight comes from. This is a quote from Julian Simon, who says that it is your mind that matters economically as much or more than your mouth or hands. In the long run, the most important economic effect of population size and growth is the contribution of additional people to our stock of useful knowledge. And this contribution is large enough in the long run to overcome all the costs of population growth. The source of these improvements in productivity is the human mind, and a human mind is seldom found apart from the human body. So what Simon is saying here is that if you want more ideas, uh, basically you need more people. So the reason this perspective has been so neglected, I think, is because the contribution that population makes to the growth of knowledge is extremely hard to measure directly, and consequently it's very hard to model. And if you can't measure it and you can't model it, then economists typically are not interested in it. Uh, but Julian Simon took up the challenge and he did a bit of work on this. And what he found was that if you were to control for income, then typically uh, ideas generation is proportional to population growth. So he finds that ideas generation is not subject to economies or diseconomies of scale. It's more or less a one-for-one -one relationship. So the more people you get, the more ideas. And the ideas themselves are subject to increasing returns to scale because once someone comes up with a new idea, in the absence at least of intellectual property rights, other people are free to adopt that idea. And so you get increasing returns from uh, new ideas. And this leads to a very optimistic conclusion because if you think that the supply of new ideas is inexhaustible, and new ideas are the source of our long-run living standards, 
then it follows that there are no technical or resource constraints on our living standards. Our living standards can basically improve forever without constraint as long as we come up with new ideas. Okay, so what drives the ideas generation process? Well, part of it is actually population growth itself in the sense that population growth, in the short run at least, will often put upward pressure on resource and other prices. And this is what we tend to think of in terms of the short run costs of population growth. Uh, but the increase in prices leads to incentives to innovate. And the somewhat paradoxical result of this is that in the long run, you end up with more resources rather than less because you find better ways to use things, uh, improved ways to get extra resources. And so he argues that short-run scarcity actually leads to long-run abundance. So the short-run costs of population growth in this perspective are basically the way you go about capturing the long-run benefits. And in fact, you don't get the long-run benefits without the short-run costs, because the short-run costs are the mechanism that drives the acquisition of the new knowledge that uh, drives long-run economic growth. Uh, another important aspect of this is population density and urbanization. So it's not just the growth rate in the population, but also the degree of concentration in the population. And this uh, goes to the various agglomeration effects, which are often talked about uh, in this context. Uh, there's a very good book that's just come out by Ed Glazer called Triumph of the City, uh, which, would, which I'd highly recommend if you're interested in uh, getting a sense of the, uh, these agglomeration effects. Uh, so Ed Glazer and uh, people like Julian Simon would argue that a lot of the costs that we associate with population growth, uh, especially in the context of cities, such as congestion, uh, high land and house prices, rather than thinking of them as a cost, we can think of them as a measure of the benefit that's conferred by population growth and density. Uh, so to give an example, uh, high house prices can be viewed as measuring the quality and value of urban land to the consumer. Now this is not to say that the supply side is not a problem. In countries like Australia it clearly is. We need a more flex flexible supply side and if we had a more flexible supply side we'd have more affordable housing. Um, but what this perspective is telling us is that taking the supply side as given, if we think about the demand for housing, then the price that people are willing to pay to uh, live in urban areas is in fact a measure of the benefit they derive from uh, living in an urban area. Uh, so many of the things that we think of as being costs associated with population growth and living in big cities uh, are in fact kind of the price of admission to the benefits. Okay, so that's the mind's perspective. I'm going to introduce a sort of fourth perspective to this, which is uh, doesn't fit neatly into the uh, other three categories. And this is the idea of gains from trade. Uh, classical liberals are very passionate about trade liberalization with respect to trade in goods and services. But the potential gains from trade from increased uh, cross-border labour mobility are orders of magnitude larger than from uh, liberalisation of trade in goods and services. And to give you one estimate in relation to this, uh, one World Bank study concluded that complete cross-border labour mobility would lead to gains from trade in the order of $40 trillion, uh, which is basically uh, over 100% of world GDP. So basically you could double world GDP by allowing full cross-border labour mobility. Now this is obviously an unrealistic scenario, but what it says is that even small increases in cross-border labour mobility potentially give you very large gains. And these gains basically swamp trade liberalisation. Uh, you would not bother getting out of bed for the Doha round compared to this. Okay, so that figure comes from a book by Lant Pritchett uh, called Let Their People Come. Uh, this is a book that's freely available on the web and I'd uh, highly recommend it. Um, and 
Lamb Pritchett says, well, why aren't we capturing these gains from trade? And his answer is that the ultimate reason there is not massively more mobility of labour across borders is that the citizens of rich industrial countries do not want it. The free market ideals of cosmopolitan, globalising economists has no political constituency. Uh, so he's presenting this as a political economy problem, but I think this is also an ideas problem. Uh, most economists are not working with a framework or ideas uh, that would give a strong case for uh, population growth or immigration. Okay, so what are the policy implications and conclusions that we can draw from this? Firstly, I should emphasize that I'm not necessarily arguing here for a higher rate of population growth uh, or a larger immigration program. Uh, my view is that the population and immigration programs should basically be allowed to find their own level. And over time, the level is going to change. But what I am arguing for is the idea that we should be much more relaxed about some of the more obvious uh, short-run costs of population growth and immigration, because they are basically the price of admission to the long-run benefits. And the other conclusion that I draw from this is to say that economists, demographers, and policymakers really need to change the way in which they argue about population growth and immigration if they're going to be uh, persuasive in this debate. Thank you.